Adolf Hitler was a murderous who slept through D-Day and died like a coward in a bunker while people like my grandfather stormed the beaches of Normandy to save the human race. It's Thursday, October 24th. I'm Jane Coaston, and this is Water Day, the show that will not be calling goldfish crackers Chilean sea bass. Yes, the company that makes goldfish says the name change is a, quote, playful nod to adults that the iconic fish-shaped snack is for grown-up tastes, too. I do not want a playful nod. I want goldfish. On today's show, North Korean troops in Russia, plus deep fakes abound. But first, yet another former member of the Trump administration is saying, yeah, Donald Trump is a fascist. In a series of interviews with the New York Times published on Tuesday, John Kelly, the former president's first and longest serving chief of staff, said Trump would sometimes talk glowingly about Adolf Hitler. He commented more than once that, you know, that Hitler did some good things too. And of course, <laughs> if you know history, um, again, I think he's lacking in that. But if you know what his, you know, Hitler was all about, uh, it'd be, you'd be pretty hard to make an argument that he did anything good. It would be indeed. And Kelly didn't mince words about his former boss. He's certainly an authoritarian, um, uh, admires people who are dictators. Uh, he has said that. Um, so he fa- certainly falls into the, into the general definition of, of uh, fascist, for sure. Kelly also confirmed reports that Trump had called members of the military who were injured or killed suckers and losers. Not just once, but multiple times. And asked, why do you people think that people getting killed are heroes? Of course, the Trump campaign dismissed Kelly's comments as debunked stories. Funny how so many people keep telling the stories and no one has debunked them. And on Truth Social Wednesday, Trump slammed Kelly as a, quote, total degenerate who was, quote, tough and dumb. How nice. He didn't address Kelly's comments directly during a campaign rally outside Atlanta Wednesday night. But he did add this line to his monologue of lies about immigrants. Historically, when you have swastikas on your forehead and swastikas all over your cheek and lots of other symbols all over your face, historically, that person isn't going to be a tremendous help to our economy. Vice President Kamala Harris seized on Kelly's comments early Wednesday. Speaking outside a residence at the Naval Observatory in D.C., Harris said the comments highlight the risks of a second Trump presidency. Donald Trump is increasingly unhinged and unstable. And in a second term, people like John Kelly would not be there to be the guardrails against his propensities and his actions. Those who once tried to stop him from pursuing his worst impulses would no longer be there. Later Wednesday, Harris headed to the Philadelphia suburbs for a CNN town hall with Anderson Cooper and an audience of what the network called undecided and persuadable voters. Cooper asked her directly whether she thought Trump was a fascist. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I and I also believe that the people who know him best on this subject should be trusted. The vice president also fielded questions from voters about how she'll work across the political aisle. She was asked by an audience member about the high price of groceries. Concerning groceries, grocery yeah. prices have gone up uh, quite a bit in the last four years. Yeah. And some people blame former President Trump. Some people blame President Biden. Who would you say is correct? And what would you do to bring prices down for Americans? Of course, she didn't blame either president. She spoke about how she would take a new approach to lowering the cost of living. My plan is to create a new approach that is the first time that we will have a national ban on price gouging. Cooper pressed her, asking why the Biden administration hasn't done more for the economy. Some voters, though, might ask, you've been in the White House for for four years, you were vice president, not the president, but why wasn't any of that done for the last four years? Well, there was a lot that was done, but there's more to do, Anderson. And, And I'm pointing out things that need to be done that haven't been done, but need to be done. And I'm not gonna shy away from saying, hey, These are still problems. There's a reason that CNN town hall was in Pennsylvania. If the campaigns had to rank which swing state was the most important, Pennsylvania would almost certainly top their lists. It's a state they visited the most and where they spent the most money on ads. It's also the swing state with the most electoral college votes up for grabs in the election. 19. And on top of that, Pennsylvania is also home to an extremely tight race that will help decide which party controls the Senate. The race pits incumbent Democrat Bob Casey against Republican Dave McCormick, a former hedge fund executive. Senator Casey stopped by to talk about his race and what Democrats can do to help Harris take Pennsylvania. 
Senator Casey, welcome to Water Day, and I am very sorry about the Phillies. <laughs> Jane, we can we can focus on next year, but we got to get the Eagles and the Steelers to keep winning now. Yeah, w- I wish we could discuss that in excruciating detail, but <laughs> I, I actually do need to talk about your race. Cook Political Report just changed your race from, to a toss-up from Lean Democrat. Why do you think that Republicans have been able to effectively close the gap in recent weeks, and how is your campaign responding? I expected that to happen all along, not not because I'm I'm clairvoyant. It just happens to be Pennsylvania. We know that in presidential races it's close, but the biggest factor, the the, re, the singular reason, or the overriding reason, this race is close is because uh, he's got uh, this billionaire-funded super PAC. These out-of-state billionaires came in and put together a super PAC, which by the end of the race will will have spent at least fifty million. There's no Senate candidate in the country on either in either party that has a super PAC set up just for them by a group of billionaires that, that is spending that kind of money. So how do you effectively counter that? What will it take? Well, I think basically what we have to do is continue to point out uh, not only how I've delivered for the state, but but the big differences between me and my opponent. While I was delivering uh, for the people of our state, whether it's infrastructure projects or capping the cost of insulin or the PACT Act for veterans who serve near these toxic burn pits or delivering the child tax credit for our families and, and working every day to try to try to lower costs for families. While I was doing that, my opponent was running the biggest hedge fund of the world, living in Connecticut, not living in Pennsylvania, and later lying about it. So I think it's a pretty clear contrast on our records, but also on basic rights, whether it's women's rights, workers' rights, or voting rights. Pennsylvania is seen as the biggest swing state prize and to win Democrats are going to need to turn out voters in and around Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. But a Politico report last week said that many state Democrats are worried about the Harris campaign's operation in that state, especially in Philadelphia. Is that a concern you share? I, I think the I think the, the the overall campaign, both Vice President Harris's campaign, our campaign, the state party, the the the, the national party, all of the different organizations that form a coordinated campaign are working well together and will continue to work well together. I've been around a while. I've heard these arguments before that there's always some this isn't working or this, you know, kind of the, the critiques. But I think people are have come together and we're seeing record numbers of volunteers. We're seeing a lot of intensity, uh, some early voting that, that, that votes well. But I think the most important thing is people know what's at stake and that, that's driving them to vote. It's driving them to not only uh, contribute to campaigns, but those same people are often knocking on doors. Um, writing postcards and making phone calls, doing everything they can. So what do you think the state party can do better to connect with voters of color and young voters? Big blocks for the Democratic Party both might be feeling disillusioned with politics. Well, I think it's a joint effort. Obviously, candidates play a role in that. I've got to earn the vote of every Pennsylvanian. And that means that means making sure that I'm going on a regular basis, as I have been, um, into uh, every every community, including black and brown communities, to say, look, this is what I've been working on to 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 uh, help advance the interests of of your families, whether it's the child tax credit or delivering money in 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 urban areas to to remove blight, uh, delivering dollars to to places like Philadelphia to reduce gun violence. And guess what? Gun violence numbers in Philadelphia are down, and part of the reason is not simply the the investments in proven strategies to reduce gun violence, but also the the, the bipartisan legislation passed uh, just a couple of years ago to reduce gun violence. Uh, also focusing on health care and, and the cost of living, taking on big corporations when they're jacking up the prices of, of uh, food and household items and ripping off people, especially in, in, uh, in middle class grocery store shoppers or, or low income communities where they're trying to make ends meet working on child care, working on issues that, that are directly relevant uh, to families in, in black, or black and brown communities. We've seen reports nationwide that Republicans are turning out in some pretty big numbers for early voting because Republicans have changed their message to voters on this. What do Democrats need to do to similarly boost turnout, especially in Pennsylvania, Michigan, these big swing states? I think we have to continue to to make sure that people know what's at stake. Uh, I think to make sure they know that, that that basic rights are on the ballot. You're starting to see it build. More and more people know that 
that uh, women's reproductive rights are on the ballot, that voting rights are on the ballot, and that workers' rights are on the ballot. And the more that I can tell them as a candidate, this is where I stand and this is where my opponent stands. I've already voted to, to, to provide a remedy or, or a restoration, of, a remedy for, for the Dobbs decision, but a restoration of Roe v. Wade. My opponent is unalterably opposed to that legislation. He'll never vote for it. He'll never vote for the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. He'll never vote for the protecting the right to organize a union. So it's really just a question of, of candidates continuing to earn the vote of the people by making sure that they know what the choice is. There's been a lot of talk about the so-called blue wall for Vice President Kamala Harris. What's giving you hope right now that the blue wall will hold for Harris? What signs can you point to? Well, I think some of that, that voter enthusiasm we're seeing in early voting, I, but I also see it on the ground, uh, not simply in a big city like Philadelphia. I just happened to be here today. It was with a group of young people from Temple University and a few other universities. But but what, what I'm seeing in small towns and rural areas where, where Democrats are often outnumbered and often outvoted in big elections, but they're coming out, they're putting up signs in their yards, they're going to events, they're engaging, they're they're going to phone banks. They're knocking on doors. So there's a lot of intensity, uh, not just in big cities, but in small towns and in rural areas, but also suburban communities where so many Republican voters are that I think we have a shot at, at uh, earning their vote as well because they know that basic rights are on the line and because they know that that uh, candidates like my opponent have been, been uh, on the extreme right. So... You, you have a direct line to our listeners, listeners who are deeply committed to helping you and helping Vice President Kamala Harris win Pennsylvania. What can our listeners do to help get out the vote? Jane, I think the short answer is probably keep doing what you have been doing, meaning a lot of your listeners are already going to events and knocking on doors and contributing money and writing postcards and doing everything they can. So just continue to amplify that. Um, if you're signed up for a day or two a week? Can you make it three days, four days a week? This is not my my line. I've heard it from a number of people. It's not the margin of error that matters. It's the margin of effort. And I think margin the margin of effort is, is being closed every day. More and more people coming out to make it clear to their friends and neighbors what's at stake on rights and on, on basic fights we're having on health care or tax policy, but also what's at stake for, for democracy itself. I've never seen a more consequential presidential and Senate election as we're seeing this year. Well, thank you so much, Senator. I really appreciate your time. Jane, thank you. We'll get to some of the news in a moment, but if you like the show, make sure to subscribe, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and share with your friends. And now the news. As we continue to look at this, there is uh, is evidence that uh, there are DPRK troops uh, in Russia. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said on Wednesday that the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or DPRK, has sent troops to Russia amid the war in Ukraine. Austin made the remarks during a press conference in Rome just two days after meeting with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. And he told reporters that what the troops are doing on the ground is unclear, but could mark an escalation of the war. If they're co-belligerents, their uh, intention is to participate uh, in this war on, on uh, Russia's behalf, uh, that is a very, very serious uh, issue. And it will have impacts not only uh, on uh, uh, in Europe, it will also impact uh, uh, things uh, in the Indo-Pacific as well. Russian President Vladimir Putin and North Korean Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un have both denied these claims. But we know that North Korea is an adamant supporter of Putin's years-long invasion of Ukraine and consistently supplies his military with weapons. It's unclear how many DPRK troops are in Russia. Zelensky said earlier this week that North Korea was preparing to send as many as 12,000. South Korea responded to Wednesday's news, saying the country would consider sending arms to Ukraine if these reports are confirmed. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. asked the United States Supreme Court on Wednesday to take his name off the ballot in Wisconsin, where voting is already underway. Just last month, the court rejected an appeal made by RFK to stay on the ballot in New York. The latest appeal is a long-shot attempt to keep him from siphoning votes away from Trump in the crucial battleground state. He said he plans to make a similar request to get his name off the ballot in Michigan. RFK suspended his presidential campaign as an independent candidate in August and endorsed Trump. He is hoping for a gig in his cabinet. 
I am hoping for the exact opposite of that happening. Microsoft's Threat Analysis Center released a report on Wednesday, cautioning voters about foreign influences from China, Russia, and Iran interfering in the election. The report says Harris's campaign has been targeted by Russian accounts using artificial intelligence and deepfake videos to show her making a, quote, crass reference to assassination attempts against former President Trump. So, but we got some work to do, okay? We got some work to do, because we know Donald Trump can't even die with dignity. He has a very different plan. Just look at his Project 2025 agenda. Weird. The report also mentions other Harris deepfakes, including one that shows her illegally poaching in Zambia. Earlier this week, U.S. intelligence officials accused Russian operatives of targeting Minnesota governor and Democratic vice presidential candidate Tim Walz with a fake video accusing him of inappropriate behavior with his students, which got millions of views on social media. In the past, these operations have largely focused on the presidential race. But this year, the attacks have moved down ballot. Dozens of fake Twitter accounts connected to China are trying to influence congressional races in Alabama, Tennessee, and Texas. The accounts have accused candidates critical of China of corruption and promoted their opponents. Intelligence officials warn that these influence campaigns are aimed at inciting violence and doubt in democracy. Former Republican National Convention Chair Ronna McDaniel, you know, Mitt Romney's niece who changed her name to please Trump, who ultimately replaced her with his daughter-in-law, yeah, her. Rana is sounding the alarm because the GOP isn't doing enough to reach Gen Z voters. In an opinion piece for The Hill, she wrote about the dangers of Republicans neglecting young voters. And she's not wrong. Just this week, a new poll from Data for Progress found that young people favor Vice President Harris over former President Donald Trump. McDaniel wrote that she's seeing the GOP's failures within her own family, writing, quote, Already my kids have been inundated by Democratic mail and texts, and my son has even had Democratic organizers knock doors in his college apartment complex. Ooh, voter outreach. So scary. McDaniel was ousted from the RNC chair earlier this year when Trump and his GOP allies blamed her for the party's low fundraising numbers and in turn 2022 midterm losses. She hasn't made a public appearance since March. And that's the news. One more thing. So we talked earlier about former Chief of Staff John Kelly's statements on the record regarding Donald Trump's longtime admiration for noted failure Adolf Hitler. Lots of people are talking about it, in fact, like Tennessee Republican Senator Bill Haggerty. What good things would you say Hitler did? Well, I wouldn't say Hitler did any good things. And I would also say this. Uh, I worked both with General Kelly and President Trump in the last administration, and it was not a good fit. Uh, General Kelly has been on record many times criticizing President Trump. Obviously, he doesn't like President Trump. Uh, I would take that with a grain of salt, just as I would some of the other things that have been reported that have been debunked consistently. And the good people of Fox and Friends. And then he obviously has frustration. And I could absolutely see him going out, you know what? It would be great to have German generals that actually do what we asked them to do, knowing that's a th- uh, maybe not fully, un- uh, fully being cognizant of the third rail of German generals who are Nazis and whatever and New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. Look, we've heard a lot of extreme things about Donald Trump from Donald Trump. Uh, it's kind of par for the course. It's really, unfortunately, uh, with, a, with a guy like that, it's kind of baked into the vote at this point. And hedge fund billionaire and notably gullible online figure, Bill Ackman. How do you get your head around that? Well, one, it's one person stating a series of things. It keeps happening over and over and over again. Donald Trump says something, and his biggest supporters don't believe it, or say that it's baked in because they want it to be. It's just someone saying something, right? Except it's Donald Trump, who was president of the United States and could be again. Here's what gets me. If you've talked to a supporter of Donald Trump, you've probably been told that Donald Trump simply won't do the things he constantly talks about wanting to do. Things like promising to jail opponents, investigate journalists, shut down media networks, and mass deport millions of people, including immigrants who are here legally. And they will tell you that Donald Trump will do a host of things he has had literally no interest in, like cleaning up America's nutritional standards and getting big corporations out of our food supply. So in short, the absolute best pitch for Donald Trump's presidency is that he will not do the stuff he says he wants to do. He's lying. He won't keep his promises. You just can't believe the things he says, even about his desire for generals just as good as Hitler's. And that's a good thing. That's all for today. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, join a phone bank, and tell your friends to listen. 
And if you're into reading and not just thinking about how Adolf Hitler was a murderous asshole who slept through D-Day and died like a coward in a bunker while people like my grandfather stormed the beaches of Normandy to save the human race, like me, What a Day is also a nightly newsletter. Check it out and subscribe at crooked.com slash subscribe. I'm Jane Coaston, and go volunteer! <laughs>